Thanks, Marty. Um, so I'm going to start this presentation and then um, Hossein will take over. And uh, basically our collaborative work is on the use of wearable sensors to promote health monitoring and tele-rehabilitation. And uh, we're going to give the background of this work and then we'll be asking our four trainees to give um, a presentation briefly on uh, their projects. And next slide, please. Okay, so um, the use of wearable sensors is really not a new topic, right? And um, I think that it's been gaining more recognition because um, we uh, recognize that the monitoring of our users uh, for their activities and health status at home or in the community um, is really uh, important. And uh, whereas the episodic evaluation and uh, monitoring in the clinic setting or in the of healthcare facility setting is really not going to be uh, representative of the patients or the users uh, daily functions and activities. Now, um, all of this is actually uh, being highlighted even further with a COVID uh, situation, because now that we are um, advising the patients and uh, people who, who usually come to the healthcare facilities to try to stay home as much as possible because of the infection risks and also because of the uh, lack of capacity, right, in the healthcare facilities, so it really highlights the, the uh, importance for us to look at how we can do remote health monitoring in the home and community setting. And uh, we know that uh, we should try to reduce hospital visits and promote uh, remote health remote healthcare, and that um, the use of wearable sensors and also um, uh, devices will be gaining even more importance. And in fact, um, the uh, revenue for this market will be very high as well. Next slide, next slide please. And um, so we have to recognize that not all of the biomedical, not all of the wearable devices are biomedical devices. And so our collaborative work between myself and Hossein is to look at uh, wearable devices and also to make sure that um, they are appropriate biomedical devices. And so you see um, in the diagram on the right hand side, we have to look at the real world need, um, the modeling, the algorithm and also data processing, in-lab validation and in-field validation. So my um, uh, input to this is uh, mostly in the real world need and the in-field validation, whereas Hossein and his lab uh, focus on the rest of it. And at this point, I'd like to turn this over to Hossein. Thank you, Chester, thank you. So um, as uh, Chester mentioned, our proposed approach uh, to, to, to develop and implement uh, after uh, validation, of course, uh, reliable biomedical uh, wearable devices um, would be uh, summarized in this uh, diagram that you see. We always start from a real world uh, clinical need, then we turn the uh, physiological um, um, problem statement into a biomedical modeling. We have uh, the development of devices and algorithms uh, with the use of um, our typically um, originally developed uh, biomedical data processing. And after that, we'll have two phases of in-lab validation and in-field, or it means in-hospital validation. After passing all these validation phases, we would uh, have the technology uh, ready for clinical implementation. Uh, in the next slide, I'm going to first talk about a few um, um, examples uh, that, that have been um, recently completed um, with, with uh, typically the case of a spinal cord injury or other neurological conditions. And later on, um, our other team members will talk about our ongoing uh, projects uh, that uh, Chester and myself are working on. <clears throat> uh, this is the first project that I want to talk about. Uh, this project has uh, recently been completed. Um, the, 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 the issue is that we wanted to have um, standing balance assessment uh, for individuals after a spinal cord injury with the eventual goal of uh, classification of, um, of individuals affected with a spinal cord injury. 
that are frequent fallers and those who have lower risk of falling. So we completed data collection in Toronto. We have a Linter Center at University of Montreal. And then um, we included a number of um, participants with incomplete spinal cord injury and controls. We simply asked them to, um, to, to, to stand eyes closed and eyes open on hard surface or foam surface. I'm not going to go through all the details. You can see the outcome uh, papers uh, here. But in summary, we noticed that our um, developed technologies were able to distinguish those with a spinal cord injury with those with controls. In addition, um, uh, that technology was able to um, um, find um, the, the, the physiological uh, or neurophysiological uh, impairments and differences between the groups and was able to um, find uh, so, so, some uh, reasons why the standing balance strategies between these individuals are different. The key important was that we did not uh, require extra time. Uh, the, all, all the assessments were completed during collection of uh, buried balance scale uh, scores uh, that are anyway used in hospitals. Uh, we just added sensors and then uh, that maximized convenience for um, the, 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 the clinicians and also uh, compliance for the patients. Similarly, we had gait analysis in 20 meter trials and also in six minute trials with different conditions, again, with reduced vision and reduced um, um, somewhat of sensory sensation uh, using uh, foam shoes. And also we again uh, understood that uh, we would be able to uh, A, reliably measure uh, gait parameters and their interest stride variability, and B, the, the interest stride variability of gait parameters was able to characterize uh, neurological impairments after a spinal cord injury. In another study, this time completed in, um, in, in Glen Rose Rehab Hospital, uh, we, uh, we tried to understand how patients with unilateral um, brachial uh, plexus injury uh, use the trunk um, to, 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 to have their, um, the, the, the normal um, function of their shoulder. And in this way, they mask um, unilateral asymmetry uh, of, I'm, I'm sorry, bilateral asymmetry of their shoulder function. So <clears throat> we were able to show that um, if, if we use uh, our uh, developed sensor technology during uh, typical clinical assessments that has, has been done already in the clinic, we just add the sensors with, um, with, with really minor um, extra time uh, to, the, to the process, um, we would be able to identify uh, the, the, the uh, trick motions of the trunk um, with uh, the, the sensor technology and, and machine learning uh, algorithms that we developed. Now, all of what I talked about was for the purpose of remote health monitoring. Now, if we want to have telerehabilitation, uh, the first step to that is to, to assess the function. And based on that assessed function, we want to send real-time feedback to the individual. And that should be done using, um, for example, mobile phone uh, applications or any other kind of feedback display system. Uh, we are working on uh, such